Hello, parents, and welcome to the Parenting with Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Erica Desper, and today I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Erin Adamitis, a licensed psychologist and the owner of the Pediatric Psychology Center of Chester County, located in Exton, Pennsylvania. In practice since 2013, Dr. Erin opened the center in early 2020 to continue her work providing both assessment and treatment of children and families managing a number of developmental and behavioral concerns. Dr. Aaron's personal approach is behaviorally based and solution focused to help both parent and child work together to see actionable change, taking into account her own experiences parenting a brood of four young children. After years of training in the world of autism spectrum disorder, more recent years of experience have led Dr. Aaron to develop a passion in working with kids managing symptoms of ADHD, anxiety, giftedness, and very often the combination of all three. Welcome, Dr. Erin. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you for joining me. So first and foremost, we are both moms in the trenches. I just want to get that across. I know, I know I'm touting us as experts, uh, but I see you on the social media. I know all about your brood. Just tell us a little bit about where you are in the um, momming career right now. Yeah, so our oldest is 10, and then we have an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a -a two-and-a-half-year-old. And I think one of the things that has been so interesting and helpful for me is started doing this, of course, much longer than our, we, since when we had kids, not knowing that two, you know, possibly three, we'll see in a few years of our (laughs) kiddos also have ADHD. So I'm able to do it all day at the office and then go home and kind of manage from the parenting side too. Right. You can't get away from it at all. No, not at all. Both a blessing and a curse. Well, it sounds like you have your hands full and I was just teasing you um, off audio that you added a puppy to the mix. So (laughs) we did, because why not? Clearly, yes, clearly you needed more work to do. Um, Well, I think it helps our audience to know that, you know, even though we we are sharing thoughts and advice and all of that. We, it's all with a dose of like, we are there. We have been there. We, we know a lot is easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a new podcast. So our audience members, I may be new to them as well, but uh, I am a mom as well. I have, as you know, a 13 and a half year old son. We are on a very prolonged journey of finding out that he has diagnoses um, and getting him, you know, adequately assessed and, and treated. And there's so many things that I wish that I knew long ago, if I could go back in time and do it again. And really that's why my mission is to find parents wherever they are on their journey, hopefully earlier on than I was or am now and get them just get the information and the resources that maybe they don't even know that they need yet. Um, so they can have it an easier, maybe more pleasant, um, effective journey than we did. So that's what brings us here today. Obviously, one of my passion projects is helping parents look for, you know, what I would call red flags, although that doesn't have to be scary, just things that we'd want to notice that are maybe a little outside of typical, or we're seeing them in a cluster um, with other things that means maybe they're not typical so that we can just, you know, find out what's going on and and get the resources we need. So today we're going to be talking about good old ADHD. How do we define it? What does it look like? What do we do if we suspect it? Um, So parents listening, um, if you've had concerns or questions about one or more of your kiddos, um, stay tuned. Here we go. So how are we currently defining ADHD? Yes. So I think this is actually one of the big problems. There's a lot of um, misconceptions about ADHD. I think most people have the visualization of a busy little boy running around the room. And in a lot of cases, it's very much looked at as a behavioral disorder that kind of just needs more either discipline or focus on treating those symptoms. But the thing that also works against us is that the diagnostic criteria that our many professionals are using have not been updated since the 1980s. Mm. So we know so much more now than we did then, but we're still working against those specifics. So for example, 
when somebody is looking at a diagnosis, you're essentially supposed to go down the checklist and look for six or more of the following group of symptoms. So for the inattentive type, um, it's those kind of common things like a lack of focus, some forgetfulness, distraction. Uh, for the impulsivity or hyperactivity, it's the more obvious fidgeting, trouble sitting still, always on the go, talking, interrupting. And then, of course, most kids generally have a combination of both. You can have predominantly inattentive, you can have predominantly hyperactive, but in most cases, you really do have both. It just may be a little bit more internalized. The other challenge is that the way the criteria is written, you have to be presenting these symptoms in two settings. So it can't just be at home. It can't just be at school. We also know now that that is not as clear cut as it seems like it should be. So we have some kids that for various reasons really work hard and hold it together at school and the teachers will basically say, nope, no concerns here. And then they fall apart when they get home. Or home settings that kind of work with the child's needs so that they feel like things are going okay. But at school, when a child is more structured and required to sit still and not speak unless they've raised their hand and things like that, that's where they kind of fall apart. So this is a big thing that I think a lot of professionals in the research are trying to attend to right now. More recently, they have at least added the social realm as being a third possible location. So mm -hmm. for our kids who maybe have trouble at home and playing with their peers, that would count as the two. Um, but the other big thing that always stands out to me is that one of the biggest things that we end up working on and families actually come in initially with concerns about is not even on the uh, criteria list is that emotional regulation piece. Mm -hmm. So our kids who are going, say, from zero to 60 or who are falling apart at home, um, you know, that isn't on the list. So most people's first thought is not ADHD. Got it. Excellent. And I, I do want to go back to that two settings thing, because I know that challenged our family for quite some time, because my son in is, is in a virtual school program, which means that his home setting is his school setting and vice versa. <laughs> Uh, so we had a challenge um, overcoming that criteria of, you know, you have to see it in more than two places. I'm like, but this is his only place. Um, so we won't go into how we how we overcame that. But I do think it's helpful for parents to know that even if you are the only one seeing it in the home setting, that doesn't mean it isn't a thing, right? So so my son also has anxiety and those two things often go together. So his anxiety about getting in trouble at school or bringing attention to himself would allow him to mask really well. And I think that's what you're referring to earlier is masking where they kind of hold it all together and present a really great front at school, but that takes a lot of energy and regulation. And then that's when they have that after school restraint collapse because there's nothing left. Um, Absolutely. so yes, I just would want parents to know, um, you know, don't doubt yourself if you're like, well, maybe is it my parenting because they seem to be so, you know, good in air quotes for the teachers. Um, and then not for me. And, and people may even say that to you. Well, it must be something about the home environment. Um, but it can in fact be the opposite. It can be the structure, the sensory profile of the school environment, <laughs> um, that's giving them a problem. So yeah, trust, trust your gut. <laughs> it's one of my big things you'll hear on this podcast a lot. Um, okay. So that was a really helpful definition. I was going to ask you if there was more than one type or manifestation. I think that we covered that. Was there anything you needed to add there? You know, I, the one thing I was going to add is there. So again, this is the criteria we're we have to work with right now. There are definitely more pockets of researchers and clinicians kind of working now on adding or ideally adding additional types where we do see different presentations. Um, and one of the things I heard more recently is that where we are with some of the epigenetics, we now know that there are 33 different genes that can be activated to cause something on the ADHD you know, spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I think when you just take that piece into consideration and it makes a lot more sense as to why two different kiddos with ADHD could look drastically different and could look different than what we have as that criteria. And again, to your point, it does not mean it's not ADHD just because it may look a little bit different. Excellent. Okay. So as I mentioned at the outset, we didn't get a diagnosis until age 13, although I was sort of whispering and then shouting and then, you know, <laughs> being the squeaky wheel um, far ahead of that. So why is this so often overlooked and why is it especially overlooked in girls? 
really important question. I think, you know, the first big piece, as we've already gone over, is the criteria that we have just is not accurate. And not not that it's not accurate, it's not complete. Mm-hmm. And what I have run into even as a mom myself is some, you know, uh, pediatricians, for example, they have a specific set of training that goes into this. Some of them I find stick really closely to this criteria. And it's, they may give you, say, a Vanderbilt skill, which has its own issues. Um, And if it doesn't elevate, they go, well, nope, can't be ADHD. So really being able to look more deeply at some of these other things that we know present in a bigger way is really important. The other thing that something I always explain to parents when we're talking about this is the hallmark of ADHD is going to be inconsistency. So that in and of itself doesn't necessarily make sense with a very specific set of criteria. (laughs) Um, But it very much explains, I think, why parents do second guess themselves because they're going to go, well, wait a minute, but you did this skill yesterday. So why are you not today? I guess I'm Mm. left to assume that you're choosing not to. And then that causes a host of issues. Or why can you do this at school, but not at home or vice versa? That's the part that doesn't make sense. And what it boils down to is that is very much true for the children as well. So they know what's expected of them. They know that they're trying really hard and they can't even figure out why it worked yesterday, but it didn't today. Or it works with mom, but not with dad. Different things like that. And so then Mm -hmm. you see more of the exacerbation of those other symptoms like disruptive behaviors or shutting down or anxiety. And that is definitely going to take a little bit more of the attention because it's, we talk about that being the branches of the tree that lead us to kind of miss the root potentially of ADHD. Sure. The, I think specifically when we're talking about girls, that is a big focus right now that hopefully we'll have more specific research and I mean, ideally criteria changes coming out soon because they really do present differently than with boys. So more often than not, you're not going to see as much of that hyperactivity. You're going to see a slight variation on some of these symptoms that, again, get missed by teachers. You know, girls, despite our best efforts, tend to be socialized a little bit differently. We have that saying, boys will be boys. You know, if they're kind of running around the room, oh, they're just active boys. Whereas girls kind of internalize pretty quickly. You can't do that. You need to sit down. You need to be, you know, polite. You should be presenting this. And so they they kind of swallow a lot of it. But it comes out in a lot more of that emotional deregulation. We see that they are quicker to cry, quicker to have um, bigger emotional responses. They may be more withdrawn. We may see that come out in some more sensory sensitivities. Um, and then we do see some things like being hyper talkative. They could be shy or they could be social butterflies. And so, again, because of this inconsistency, they tend to be missed very typically until closer to middle school, when now the executive functioning demands are so great that they officially reach their wall and kind of start to fall apart in other ways. And that was exactly what we experienced. It was more of the emotional regulation piece in elementary school, maybe the sensory piece. And that was why I was a little quiet about needing help. I thought I just had like a really highly sensitive person. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you mentioned, once the workload increased, once he really, he started switching rooms and switching teachers and needing to remember to bring materials from place to place and dealing with different personalities and different um, environments, uh, that was when we really noticed that it was more of an academic (laughs) challenge. And for anybody listening who isn't familiar with what you mean when you say executive functioning, um, what's your most concise? I know it's very broad, but what's a concise explanation of that? Yes. So the I like to use a lot of analogies and visualizations. So what I explain to parents is that essentially you have roughly 10 executive functioning buckets in your brain. They include things like planning, organization, task initiation, emotional control, working memory, all these different things that go in there. When you have an ADHD brain, you're putting so much energy into all of these other things that you have to be conscious about because it's not functioning efficiently. You may only have enough water to fill five buckets at one time. Which five are filled at a given time are going to change. And so that's where you see more of this inconsistency and frustration because there's no rhyme or reason to it. But you're also going to be expounding twice as much energy to try and basically meet baseline as your peers who have the ability to just fluctuate between these buckets without even thinking about it. Yeah. And I always say like, even a faster is like any, everything you would need to like start and 
work through and complete a task. <laughs> like it's literally everything that we need for everything. <laughs> yes, all day long. We just don't always break it down into like, oh, I needed to, you know, think and I needed to plan and I needed to hold that in my memory. Um, but it does become more obvious. Uh, yeah, as the workload increases. Yes. Okay, so another challenge that our family encountered, um, which leads me to my next question is, can other diagnoses be misconstrued as ADHD? Um, because we ran into the challenge that the original provider we went with said, I, I can't diagnose this because he also has anxiety and it's too hard to tell them apart, which was very frustrating for me having, having sat on a wait list and waited for this appointment with a psychiatrist for so long, uh, who shall not be named. Um, <laughs> Is that a common thing that it's hard to pick apart? It, does it usually stand on its own or is it appearing with other diagnoses? Yes. So I would say this kind of fits into why it is often missed because it can be masked by other things or misunderstood as other things. Mm -hmm. So one of the big ones that we have a lot of families come in, um, some other provider will have told them that their child has oppositional defiant disorder, or mm -hmm. parents themselves will have Googled that and said, oh, yes, this all fits. And in 99.9% .9 of the cases, I take that away and explain to them that the main difference is a can't, not, won't scenario. So in the case where our kids likely have an underlying ADHD, there is a true struggle. They are trying, they are getting to a point where they don't feel efficient. They feel like they're failing all the time. And so they may get to a point where it's kind of like the only control I have is just to say, nope, I'm not going to do that and self you know, protect. And so that's where it's stemming from. Whereas a child with ODD basically has more um, more control over their capabilities. And so it's it's more a matter of, I know if I don't do this, it's going to upset you. And I really like that. So I'm going to choose to do that. When, if we are able to properly attend to the ADHD symptoms and those behaviors clear up, as they almost always do, then we know we had it right. If the behaviors still stick around, okay, then maybe there is a true ODD on top of it. But I think in the 13 plus years I've been doing this, I've seen one child that I actually gave that to. So mm. that's a big one. Um, to your point, anxiety is the other huge one. I don't think in 13 plus years, I've seen a child who has ADHD who does not also have anxiety because of this inconsistency. They are desperately trying so hard. And it's kind of like every day, they don't know from minute to minute what they're going to do well, what they're going to get in trouble for, or get corrected for. So when we are looking at an assessment, trying to tease that apart, anxiety can be tricky because yes, it can lead you to be inattentive or fidgety or something like that. But you really won't see as many of these executive functioning challenges. So if I'm doing a diagnostic interview with an incoming family and I run down that executive functioning list and we're hearing, you know, check, 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 that already is putting me on the ADHD path. Whereas for anxiety, more often than not, they're going to say, no, she actually does well with this or, or he, he can do this when he needs to. It's really just one or two things. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we try and consider is that that tree analogy. Very often we have kids come in who have had therapy and sometimes even medication for anxiety or depression for years, for quite a while. And parents are saying it's still not getting better, you know, and that's a sign again, because we're not getting to the root. And it's, it's amazing to me how many times we flip flop and say, you know, if, what if they try a stimulant and suddenly all the anxiety also goes away. So it's mm -hmm. not a matter of necessarily stacking up what you need to treat. Got it. And it, I think what I hear you saying, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if a parent were to receive that response from a provider of like, oh, we just can't tease this apart, um, I guess you'd recommend a, a second opinion from another provider who does feel qualified to tease it apart. I would. and I, Which is, of course, what we did. Sure. Well, good. Thank goodness for your son. I, you know, I think it's it's hard. I think in a lot of ways, anxiety is looked at as something of an easier diagnosis in some ways, maybe easier to accept, potentially easier to treat. And I think, um, I, I personally think it's really important to, when ADHD is possibly on the table, find somebody who really is something of an expert and who is up on the research to really be able to get at some of these underlying pieces, or you will continue just to kind of get lost up in the branches. Sure. Okay, excellent. So you mentioned uh, ODD and anxiety. Any other common things that may 
may be misconstrued for or with? I think there there's definitely a lot of overlap. And so sometimes it depends essentially which symptoms may have presented first, but different mood disorders, you know, depression and, and bipolar are going to be big ones that come up. I think the bipolar, especially in childhood, is a really, really important one to find an expert, potentially, ideally in both ADHD, because uh, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a huge movement where there was an awful lot of diagnosis of childhood bipolar, which to treat medically is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And now looking back on it, a lot of it was probably ADHD. So that just created a world of a mess. But the sure. other big one that comes up often is learning disabilities. And so mm -hmm. if you have these executive functioning challenges, it is going to affect you academically, regardless of how bright you are. So really being able to tease out and say, are, say, these reading and writing challenges stemming from the multi-step processing required? to get the task done, as well as the motivation and, and the working memory to hold the prompts in your mind versus a true learning disability, because they will be treated differently. Right. Excellent. Okay. So let's say that a parent, her caregiver, uh, provider is listening. What can we be looking for both at school and or at home? Um, I mean, you've kind of touched on this, but let me just ask it specifically. What flags are we looking for to know? that maybe we need to take the next step. And even before I let you answer, I'm going to go back to something you said earlier of the clue for me. One of the early clues for me was, as you touched on the, um, the effort that my son was expending, this was in like, in my clear view, this was not a matter of not trying or not caring or not listening. <laughs> um, he would try really hard. And both of us would be very frustrated with the results. And it wasn't like on a bad day. This was, of course, a pattern across different subjects and different days and different weeks. Um, and I think, yeah, it just as soon as your gut is telling you like that the performance doesn't match the capability and the effort, I would say as a non-professional, what's the flag? Do you agree with that? And what would you add? That is the first thing on my list. So yes, I think that that's the number one thing. Um, a lot of times when we see adults who come in for a diagnosis, it's the number one thing they're saying that they were always told they were lazy or they weren't working hard enough. And then, you know, very often we do that testing and be like, no, actually you should have been in gifted classes or something like that. Um, so I think when that, that effort or even just the performance isn't matching what you feel their potential is, that's a huge one. I think that inconsistency is also a huge piece, you know, that's going to really affect a lot of times the parent-child relationship when it just feels like it's a lot harder than it should be. Um, you know, I think and when it's rising to that level where you go, this is not healthy for us, like this may be part of development, but something just feels extra here. Definitely a good idea to to check it out. And I think the more maybe you're able to look at, say, a website or even a um, Google image on executive function and kind of know what all of those skills are if you feel like even just a few of them are not functioning as they should be. That would be the big sign. Yeah. And I know one of the things that your center also offers is parent coaching. And I would encourage any parent, if there's a huge disagreement on the topic of, you know, is our child having a hard time versus is our child giving us a hard time by choice, that creates a lot of conflict between partners. Um, I know it did for us. We both had very different stances on the matter. And, and ultimately, I think in certain instances, we are both correct, or it was a combination of the two. But we did learn that for the most part, he was having a hard time. Um, and that's another thing I would say to parents is like, yes, we want to get a diagnosis and an adequate support for our child. But it's so helpful for us as the, the adults <laughs> to have a clear understanding of what is within your child's control, what isn't, what, what help do they need, because it really helps with your window of tolerance <laughs> for patients oh, yes. when you're dealing with your child. Um, that, was, that was my experience. So definitely look into the parent coaching aspect of it as well. Um, all right. Well, that brings me to my next question. Do we always need to seek a diagnosis. I'm in a lot of parent Facebook groups and I see a lot of moms in particular asking like, do I have to go get it? I mean, you know, what if I suspect, but maybe it's not having a huge impact or we feel like a handle on it. Do we have a handle on it? Do we always need a diagnosis and do we always need to treat? Mm -hmm. Great question. 
I'm probably a little biased, of course, since I do it all day, every day. (laughs) But I think there is an awful lot of value out of basically having that answer and just having a name for it. Um, Again, it's one of the things that stands out for me, being able to do both adult diagnoses and children, just to see how the same trajectory plays out almost every single time, regardless of, you know, parents were supportive or what the path was. The adults feel like they knew all along and they felt like it was just something wrong with them. And on the flip side, it's amazing to see how many kids, when we go through an evaluation and we give the diagnosis and have a conversation and they just kind of go, oh, so there's a name for it. It's not just me. I'm not just screwing up. And, you know, just to be able to put all of this under one heading, I think really helps also for parents rather than just, you know, feeling like they need to try harder. I think The other thing that's important is if we do know that the challenges are going to be executive functioning based, it really does change what you're going to do. So I'll tell parents that 95% of what you're already doing is spot on. It probably works beautifully for your other children. But without having this understanding and tweaking for executive functioning, that last 5% is just not going to land. And you're going to end up in these cycles where, say, your child um, maybe gets in trouble or gets corrected for something, there's a consequence, but then you're back in the same scenario the next day because we're not setting them up for efficient learning to be able to really feel successful. So Mm -hmm. I do think the diagnosis really goes a long way. What you choose to do with treatment, there's a number of options from there. Sure. And I, I know that some parents are afraid of labels. Um, my current stance, having gone through what we've gone through, is we just simply couldn't get our son any of the supports he needed at school until he had the labels. So if that's what they achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in our experience, they did not make him feel bad. It's just a way for him, like you said, to understand that it's it's not just something that's hard for him because he's not trying. There's a reason for it. It helps his teachers understand that there's something more going on. It helps the staff, you know, write up the things that they're going to write up. So there is something to be said for (laughs) for getting the labels, not just to have them, but because they open a lot of, a lot of doors in many cases. Um, Okay. And what, let's say a parent is considering assessment for their child. I know you can only speak probably for your um, process, but what would an assessment look like? Yes. So I think it's part of what is confusing. You know, our field doesn't make it easy, but there's multiple pathways to go through this. So a lot of parents probably know you can go to your pediatrician and a lot of times it's kind of that simple checklist and they either diagnose or don't. And that's, you know, to the point. This is also something you can technically do through school. Um, But it's important to know that schools are only required to do assessments if the child is struggling academically to the point where they're essentially going to be at like a C grade level or lower. So a lot of times if they're doing okay in school, that won't happen. And then even in those cases, uh, in most situations, you will be getting a school classification, not an actual diagnosis. So where we come in, you know, being kind of from the clinical psychology perspective is being able to touch on all the pieces, let you know clinically what it looks like now, what the trajectory is going to look like, and also make some of those school recommendations. Some places will, again, just do a lot of rating forms and maybe a diagnostic interview. You know, that is one way to go about it. I personally get an awful lot out of including a full IQ testing as well as working memory. A, because that helps to streamline the supports you're going to recommend rather than kind of doing a lot of trial and error. We can say this is exactly how your brain works and therefore these strategies are most likely going to be the most successful. Um, But also it is amazing how often our kids who fit this bubble are above average, if not all the way well into the gifted range. And a lot of times we're the first ones presenting that to families saying, did you realize just how bright they were? And of course, that's really important because if you have this seemingly misbalance of really strong intellectual ability, but again, your performance maybe is lower, or even you have a drastic split, let's say between verbal IQ and processing speed and how quickly you're able to do things, that is very much going to affect what your output is and what people are going to see. So that kind of gets us into the world of our kiddos who are twice exceptional and who are balancing both. It's really not just taking those two things and putting them together. It's a whole new bundle that is also misunderstood and kind of on the cusp of 
um, you know, having the attention it needs. Well, and I, in my understanding, another shift that is happening or has started to happen in recent years is moving from what we would call a deficit model of like here are the things your child is, is low in, is struggling in, is challenged with to more of a strength based. Here's where they're strong and let's how can we use those strengths to offset the deficits and, and you know bring them up to speed. So knowing where they are strong, I think would be really not just great in terms of their confidence and the parents seeing that it's not just solely about effort or even intelligence, um, but just to sort of find that balance of of that strength based model. Yes, absolutely. And I think that also goes into your previous comment about if we get a, a diagnosis and why that's helpful. I think it's really important, but also difficult for us as parents to kind of take a step back and recognize maybe what we're bringing to the table if we're hesitant about that. I think there's it goes a long way depending how we present that to the kids. And that's always the conversation I have. We all have things we're really good at and we have some things that we struggle with. The cool thing about this testing and what we're doing here today is it's going to tell us exactly what you're really good at and also give us some tips and tricks to help you through those things that might be more challenging. Right. Excellent. Okay. So you touched on earlier that um, there were various avenues for treatment and I'm sure there's so many we may not be able to get to them all here, but if you had to give parents a few contrasting options. Um, what what can treatment look like and does it always involve medication? So it definitely does not always involve medication. You know, you have kind of that option of either or both. For most of the things that we work with, you know, the research really does show that the two together are going to yield the most efficient results. Um, you know, it, it is a medical disorder and we know that there's a lot of behavioral output. So in theory, putting both together would make it a little bit easier. But if we are just looking at that therapeutic route, um, again, a little bit biased, but I think it's, it really should be executive functioning based. Um, one of the analogies we use is if you have an ADHD brain, it's like you have a little race car engine with bicycle brakes. So if you imagine a scenario speeding towards a cliff, by the time you realize there's a cliff coming, your bicycle brakes are not going to do anything. Mm. Once you speed over that cliff, there's nothing you can do. You're kind of on the ride till you crash at the bottom. And then you go, oh, that's what I should have done. I should have just braked earlier. But the very next day, you're going to do the exact same thing again and again because nothing has changed. So our strategies, when I say need to be executive functioning based, they basically have to plan before you get to these situations to help give you kind of a script or a map for what to do properly. Mm -hmm. um, so that part's really going to be important. Similarly, I think involving the parents and having some kind of support is going to be really, um, I, I feel like mandatory because some of my kiddos will be in session. They are so eager to do these strategies we're talking about and by nature of the game, by the time they reach the elevator, they've forgotten. And then I don't see them again for a week or two. So being able to communicate to parents, here's what we talked about. Here's how you can help remind him or her of this strategy throughout the week. So you're actually getting that practice in really is going to be important. And I, I find across the board, the kids really want that too, because they recognize, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I really do need that support. For sure. All right. Um, let's say that a parent is listening and they do notice signs and they're, yep, yep, all that. <laughs> what is, it can be overwhelming to think like, oh, first we might think like something's wrong with my child. Hopefully we've, we've made parents' minds at ease about that. Uh, it's just a difference. We just need information and support. Um, so, but what the overwhelming part is like, well, now what? <laughs> do I start with the pediatrician? Do I have to, do I start with the school? Do I go outside? And, and every scenario is obviously unique, but what would you say a parent's first step would be if they're seeing signs and they do want to get some information and support? Sure. I think in a lot of cases, many parents turn to their pediatricians first, um, not only for to see their opinion, but also because they tend to have a list of local resources that maybe they've already worked with who they could refer somebody to. Um, what I think ends up or what I find ends up being even more helpful for a lot of parents is to seek out parent communities. So whether that's on Facebook or through a group like the Special Needs Collective, really being able to tap into the other parents who've already gone through this mm -hmm. and can say, hey, don't go here. You know, we this is our experience or this is somebody who we found really effective for our family, we highly recommend them. And you can kind of yes. hopefully troubleshoot the process. 
there are so many parents that have already done all the legwork. So why not benefit <laughs> from what they've learned along the way? That is my Absolutely. mission. The legwork is a full-time job in and of itself. Mm -hmm. All right. So I we're getting toward the end here. I so appreciate your time. I want to throw two questions at you that I did not prep you for in advance. So forgive me. <laughs> Uh, to go back to one thing you said earlier about it getting harder as the the grades and the content and all of that. Um, so if a parent's thinking like, is it possible if I just do nothing? Like, could my kid grow out of this? If it's a, you know, developmental delay, maybe in three years, it'll look a lot better. Um, what would you honestly say to that parent? That is a really tricky one because technically, yes, it is an option and there is a possibility that your child will grow out of it. But to me, that is a huge gamble because what is much more likely and more common is that they continue to sink deeper and deeper. They flounder. And then in many cases, by the time families maybe get to us, we're now cleaning up a lot of depression and self-esteem issues and certainly anxiety before we can start to touch on those. School refusal. Issues. Yes. Or avoidance. So, I think, again, that like that cliff analogy, you know, kind of expecting them to just figure it out. They're not going to. That is the challenge. And so the quicker we're able to, <coughs> excuse me, they still, we may help them setting out a map or a script. They still have to follow it. They still have to develop those skills. So I think a lot of times parents' concern is I don't want to jump in and help them or save them. I want them to learn these things. You still are and you still can do that but they may actually need to be taught those things first. Whereas perhaps those of us without ADHD were able to say, oh, I was given a planner. Okay, I can figure out how to use this and kind of take it from there. Excellent, thank you. All right, so for my last question, if you can take off your psychologist owner hat and put your uh, mom of, of a brood of four hat back on, uh, obviously my main mission is to help parents parent with confidence. So not only did I learn what I needed to know, I feel too late in my journey, I second guessed myself all along the way, uh, which is really a terrible feeling. We're trying to find that perfect way to parent, which of course does not exist. There's just a lot of ways to, to parent well, <laughs> not perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to ask all of my guests, if there was one thing you could tell a parent listening today with your mom hat on that could help them parent more confidently, and you may need a minute to think about this, <laughs> what would you say as an experienced mom of four? It does not have to be ADHD related. Sure. Actually, I think I've heard the most helpful thing that I share with parents is, listen, I do have a clinician hat. I do this all day and I go home and I make the exact same mistakes, things that are coming out of my mouth. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, what are you doing? That is wrong. And then I panic and text my, you know, grad school friends who are also parents and clinicians and say, tell me you're messing this up too. And they're all like, oh my gosh, yes. So I always come back to that and say, listen, not a single one of us is doing it correctly because there is no correct way or we would all be following the same manual. I personally think that is actually in a weird way um, a silver lining because it gives us that opportunity to effectively model how to learn and grow and how to essentially fix those mistakes when we make it. I have had many nights where the days didn't go well, you know, and I go in to, to tuck my son in and say, all right, you know what? Today wasn't the best. Here are the things that I know I did not do well. And here's what I'm going to try and do tomorrow. How about you? Mm -hmm. Anything that you've you're going to try on tomorrow and really being able to model for them that I am also not perfect. So when you are maybe having a hard time, at least we're in this together and we will figure it out. We'll keep working on it. I love that. I love that so much. Dr. Erin Adamitis, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise. I will make sure that we let our parents know where to come find you and your team if they need support. And I'm sure we'll have you back on again to talk on another topic. Thank you so much. Thank you.